Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the C4 Corvette was a pivotal moment in Corvette technology. So prior to that, the Corvette was really considered to be not so much a sports car, but more of a muscle car. And I know that's debatable because it has a four wheel alignment. You can, you know, add more negative camber to the rear wheels. And for many, you know, that's a sports car. For me, it's a sports car. But it didn't have the reputation internationally as a car that handled well. It was still thought of as more or less a car that would accelerate really quickly. Now, the 84 Corvette absolutely shattered those expectations. When Car and Driver and Motor Trend and all the major uh, automotive publications started to review the car, they were blown away. And even before that, at the reveal, people looked at that car and they could just see it was complete turnaround for GM. It was like the new era of performance. And even the dash, and this is the funny thing about being the age I am right now, I, I was a kid when the 84 Corvette came out, and I had never seen a car with a dash like the 84 Corvette, all digital dash. And see, here's the thing. When you bought a car, and I could say this all the way up to the mid-2000s, none of them had all the gauges that the 84 Corvette had. I mean, typically what you see is, is speedometer, obviously, your coolant temperatures, um, you know, your, your voltage and for many cars in your fuel. And that's about it. Plus idiot lights. This Corvette came with every possible gauge that you would need oil pressure, oil temperature. And those are two really important gauges. If you race, because, you know, if you're in a situation where your oil temperatures are getting too high, it's a good indicator that you're wearing out your bearings, that the temperatures are just too high. And that's something that racers should know about. Many people don't. So I don't want to get too far into that. But the point is, you had automatic uh, transmission temperature fluid as well. Um, every possible gauge known to humanity on these cars. I mean, it even estimated your fuel economy, how many miles you have left on your tank. All the stuff that we kind of take for granted on modern sports cars was all there on an 84 Corvette. It was really something amazing. Now, I'm not even getting into the way the car looked. I mean, it was so new age, new era. It looked so space age like to me as a kid. It just was so badass. I mean, the shape of it, when the clamshell hood, you'd open it up and you'd see the front suspension and the tires and everything plus the engine. Oh man, I had never seen anything like that in my life. I mean, that's the stuff... I would have expected from an exotic sports car at that time. And, you know, Chevrolet did it for an affordable price. So people were blown away. And then when they started testing these cars, they were just shocked at the numbers that they were getting at the track. I mean, they were putting down amazing numbers. And you got to remember, and this is what's so interesting about the C4 era, that first year, they weren't wholly prepared to come to production yet. In fact, it was supposed to come to production in 1983, but they were just behind in production. A few times GM had had strikes at where they were making the new engines. There were, there were always issues that, uh, that would come up right around the time they were supposed to roll out the new car. So anyway, 84 was the first year, and that's why when you look at the end of the C3, they had something called Crossfire Fuel Injection. Now, basically, it was like two throttle bodies. It was pretty antiquated by today's technology, but they were getting close. And unfortunately, they didn't have the tune port injection, excuse me, the tune port you know, fuel injection ready in 1984. So th they basically had the holdover from the 83. And that's why the horsepower numbers and even the torque numbers were pretty anemic on the 84. It was like... Um, it was, I, I believe it was 205 horsepower and uh, something like 295 foot pounds of torque, which I know by today's standards is a joke, but you got to remember the car was light. Yeah, it was 205 horsepower, 290 foot pounds of torque. Now the peak horsepower was at 4,300 RPMs and the, and the peak torque was at 2,800 RPMs. Okay. I know that's pathetic by today's standards, but you got to remember the car weighed just under 3,200 pounds. 
And you got to remember too, cars were not making much power during this era. We're coming out of what I call the smog dog era, where, you know, the federal government laid down, you know, pretty strict guidelines on um, emissions in automotive vehicles. And the automotive companies, they weren't prepared for it. There wasn't any funded mandate to make sure that they had the technology to actually develop it. They were just like, okay, by this date, this is what you have to have. <laughs> and of course, nobody was prepared for it. So anyway, it was a good thing though. They just should have funded the mandate. Um, in 1985, and this is why I want to kind of flip ahead here. In 1985, they came up with um, tune port fuel injection. And that began the era of computer controlled technology and tuning. And 85 was a very significant year because you had um, tune port fuel injection. And suddenly the horsepower went from, you know, an anemic 205 to 230 horsepower and the torque because they could rev the engine more, right? Um, the, the intake runners weren't too short. Well, they were still short, but they were longer than what you saw on the 84. So now you got 330 foot pounds of torque at 3,200 RPMs. Again, this is a very lightweight car. 230 horsepower at 4,000 RPMs. Now, I know we laugh about this. That's like a truck engine. In fact, trucks rev a lot higher than that nowadays. But around that time, that's about where, you know, that was like truck RPMs. Again, though, the car really performed. Of course, it was going 0 to 60 under 6 seconds, I think around 5 point... No, actually, it was around 6.1, I think, that year. Anyway, still fast for that era. And it was really interesting because, you know, cars in that era just were not making a lot of horsepower. I mean, even like uh, some of the exotics, like a Lamborghini Countach was making like, I don't know what it was, three 300 something, 375 horsepower. And that was supposedly the fastest car in the world at that time. <laughs> so... It was a different era. You have to always judge um, these cars based on their respective eras. Now, I want to talk about the transmissions because from 1984 all the way through 1987, I believe, they had the basically two transmissions. They had a manual, a four-speed, yes, a four-speed manual transmission with uh, an electronic three-speed overdrive. So it was called the Doug Nash 4 Plus 3. It sounded so badass at the time when I was a kid, but now that I've become an adult and I uh, and I see how bad that really is, you know, to rebuild something like that, it's not really worth ever putting in your Corvette. But that's what they had at the time. So basically, it was a four-speed manual transmission, and you had three buttons to go into overdrive. So it was a seven-speed uh, transmission. It was just kind of weird because it was really more of a, a four-speed manual with a three-speed automatic on top of it. I know it sounds bizarre, but that's what it was in that era. Okay, so um, that was the transmission for that time period. Now, the other option was the four-speed automatic, which was pretty much the transmission of preference. Most of the cars came with the four-speed automatic. Even when they tested them in zero to 60 in quarter mile times, it was always faster it with the four-speed automatic so that was the time period <laughs> yes i know you guys that love manual transmissions like myself would have been a little bit disappointed during that time period but here's the thing in 1988 alas came the zf6 now that was a great transmission and that later became the transmission that was in the zr1 corvette now, I want to talk very briefly about the ZR1, but before I get into that, I just want to kind of finish out the rest of the early part of the C4 era. Now, by the time 1990 rolled around, the, uh, the early model C4s, the ones that had the L98, and that L98 engine came around in 1985, and what obviously separated it from the L83, which was the first year of the 84 Corvette, was the tune port fuel injection, computer controlled, um, you know, tuning that was going on while you're driving the car. You, you know, it was the modern era of computers. Now, it was very antiquated by today's standards, even by the standards of the later model C4s. And before I get into those, I just want to talk about very briefly I know there's a lot of the early model C4s out there. They made a lot more of them. 
And if you're looking to buy any of those, I would really buy 88 and up. And in fact, if you really have your heart set on buying um, a C4 Corvette with an L98 in it, I would really focus on getting probably a 90 or a 91. Now, the 91, I think, is probably the best year of the early C4s because it has the L98 engine, but it's making 250 horsepower, 345 foot-pounds of torque, and it really doesn't have any of the potential pitfalls that the, that the earlier model C4s had in terms of the L98. In other words, it was more refined. It didn't have the bugs in it. Um, it was basically a really good package, but it had the modern gauges that you started to see from 91 through 96, which is the 50% digital, 50% analog. Now, it's interesting that GM kind of made that switch. And I think what was happening by 87, I think Corvette owners were starting to complain that, well, you know, we love the digital gauge, the all digital gauge, but we would probably prefer to have an analog tack and an analog or even maybe the option of an analog digital miles per hour. Now, the miles per hour stayed analog, excuse me, stayed digital, but the tack became um, analog. And all the gauges, like on my car, on my 96, you had the option, and they were basically right there in your dash to the right. Oil temperature, um, coolant temperature, um, oil pressure, uh, voltage, all that stuff was in a cluster in the gauge to the right, in the, excuse me, in the dashboard, in the gauge cluster, I should say, uh, to the bottom right of the screen. And it's great. You could see it. It was right there. Now, the other beauty is if you just want a more precise look at it, you could click on the digital um, button and it would take you to each one of the gauges. And that's my favorite set of gauges in the C4 era, as much as I was blown away by the early um, C4 all digital dash. It really, you know, it had problems. Some of those, um, some of the bulbs in it would burn out and it was just expensive to fix. And I, I could honestly say my gauges, my gauge cluster in my 96, it's getting old. It's going to be 30 years pretty soon. It still works flawlessly well and very accurate, I might add. Anyway, so if you're looking to buy, you know, you have your heart set on more of an early model C4, I would get the 1990 or 91. Probably the 91 because that has the modern looking, you know, square tail lights in the back and the modern interior and dash. But if you don't like the look of that and you still like the older, you know, um, oval or circular rear tail lights, then I would probably definitely get a 90 if you could find one. Okay, so... Now, this is where things got really interesting for GM because GM decided they wanted to kind of dabble in the supercar market. And they developed what was called as the, well, the project, the name of the project was called King of the Hill. And it was basically the ZR1. And the ZR1 was really kind of a groundbreaking um, Corvette. So it, even though a lot of people kind of criticize the looks of it because it really didn't look any different than, you know, your common 91 through 96 uh, C4. But there were a lot of subtle differences um, physically with it. Like it had a much wider body. It had, you know, much larger wheels and tires and larger brakes, of course. Those were things that would immediately stand out to you, to your eyes when you gaze at it, right? The first thing that would pop out would be the width the uh, and the the width of the tires and wheels and brakes, all of that was much larger. So this began what I would call a real shift in GM's thinking. So prior to that, all the years before, um, GM engineers would always design what's known as the small block pushrod V8. And what does that basically mean? It basically means there's no dual overhead cams, None of that fancy stuff that you saw with, you know, the modern um, sports cars that started surfacing around that time in Europe. It was always a commitment to more displacement, better airflow through the cylinder heads, and just the typical pushrod V8 with, uh, with a single camshaft, Basically right? the V8 that we've all come to love, right? Okay, so what did GM do? Now, they didn't have the technology in-house at the time to develop an all-aluminum dual overhead cam V8. 
that's just not the direction GM was going in. So what they ended up doing was they reached out to Lotus and Lotus basically designed that V8 because they, you know, they'd been developing dual overhead cam engines for quite some time. Now, they also reached out to Mercury Marine to actually produce the motor. And Mercury Marine makes some pretty badass engines, especially at that time for boats. So it was, it was a smart decision. The only thing is it really pissed off engineers inside GM because they were like, wait a minute, you're going to a dual overhead cam? You know, it's just, I can't explain to you the amount of anger and just betrayal that people in GM's uh, engineering circle felt because they were always the curators and architects of the Corvette and they reached out to Lotus and Mercury Marine. That was like the worst thing uh, GM's brass could have done at that time. So it actually was a positive thing. And I'll explain why in a moment. So the first year, uh, like I said, this was a completely different car, even though it looked very similar. It had a 5.7 liter dual overhead cam V8. Um, I don't want to get too far into the minutia of it because there's plenty of videos on ZR1s the C4 ZR1s, but I do want to just briefly mention it. At first year, it made 385 horsepower at 6,200 RPMs, which is such a dramatic difference compared to the L98, which was, what, uh, 5,000 RPMs by 1990, 40, really like 4,800. And now they're up to 6,200 RPMs. And that's the advantage of having a dual, over cam, dual overhead cam engine. Now, also, the torque was 370 foot-pounds at 4,200 RPM. So it still made that, you know, stump-pulling torque that we've all come to love from the L98. So it had the best of both worlds, and people were really excited about this car. And then they made a few adjustments to the engine the next year to the intake runners, and it made 405 horsepower and a similar amount of torque. And it was just a monster of a car. I mean, it was faster than all the top exotics at that time. And people were really excited about it. However, there was one major problem with this car. Cost. It was absolutely prohibitive cost at the time. I believe it was $50,000 at the time. And uh, that was just way beyond what anybody who would buy a Corvette would pay. Um, so they didn't sell as many of them as they would have liked to sell. And during that time, something very interesting happened. The engineers very offended by GM's brass's decision to, you know, reach out to Mercury Marine and especially Lotus for the architecture and design in house, they began designing a new small block, a new era small block. And what they basically did was they designed reverse flow cooling. Um, they had a cam driven um, water pump. They made a lot of changes to the small block V8 and really redesigned the intake manifold. So it had much longer runners, which meant it could rev to much higher RPMs. So all this was going on while the uh, ZR1 was in it, all of its glory. So... We're talking uh, 1990 through 1991. They were designing this brand new small block V8. And when it came out in 92, it made 300 horsepower and 340 foot pounds of torque. Now that still sounds like, you know, a big difference between the LT5 and the LT1, but it really wasn't when you think about it because it revved much higher. It didn't just make torque. It actually made power. And a base model um, Corvette at that time, a C4, equipped with an LT1 with a ZF6 speed that was also in the uh, ZR1, could put down track times. And when I say track times, I don't mean quarter mile and zero to 60. I mean like a road course or an autocross, something where there was a lot of turns and you know tight turns, high speed turns, a lot of combinations. The C4 with the LT1 and six-speed manual ZF6 had very similar times to the ZR1. Now, the ZR1 was still faster, no question about it, but it was an interesting dilemma that GM had because now 
the difference in performance was pretty somewhat somewhat moderate, I would say. And did it justify spending almost thirty thousand dollars more for that ZR1? And I think that was a period where GM's engineers, you know, quietly grinned and laughed at GM's brass because they, in some ways, kind of killed the ZR1 because I'm sure a lot of buyers were out there going, well, wait a minute, I can't even afford, you know, 50 plus thousand dollars for a sports car for a Corvette. And I can buy a base model one with a ZF6 and Z51 suspension. And, you know, that came with a lot of other things too as well, larger brakes, um, you know, transmission cooling. And it was much more uh, adept as a track car than, you know, the regular base model C4s at that time. And I could just see how a lot of owners were like, you know, I think I'm just going to go for the base model with the LT1 and I could do mods myself and probably be pretty close in performance to a ZR1. So that went on for a number of years, 92 through 95. And GM came to an interesting crossroads. They're like, okay, what do we do with the ZR1? Because now the LT1 is just about as fast. Um, are we going to continue to make this engine? Are we going to continue to make something like this? And during that time, once again, GM's engineers, um, having still having that bad taste in their mouth from uh, the brass going, to, you know, reaching out towards Lotus and Mercury Marine, were designing the LS motor, which as we've all come to love as the LS1 and LS6s and LS2s and that whole era, the LS7, the LS motor era. And uh, they were, again, designing the engines much, much lighter because those engines were all aluminum, where the LT1 still had an iron block, had aluminum heads, and a lot of the modern technology, uh, even in 96, they had ODB2, and I'll get into that in a moment. But the LS motors were far superior in terms of, um, you know, efficiency and power. And the other thing they kind of tooled around with the idea is let's make an all-wheel drive, you know, um, Corvette. <laughs> and of course, the weight was like 4,000 pounds, just way too heavy. No way they were going to ever produce a Corvette that weighed 4,000 pounds. That just wasn't going to happen. So it got scrapped. And uh, it makes a lot of sense why it got scrapped. Because later on, when uh, GM designed the LS motors and uh, eventually uh, came up with the Z06, the 2001 Z06. The 2001 Z06 was a faster car. I mean, in every possible way. It was so much lighter, too. It was 3,100 pounds. GM had basically, you know, the brass had re recognized that the engineers inside GM, you know, they could design supercar performance, but you had to give them the obje objectives and budget to do it. So... That basically brought the end of the C4 era and the end of the ZR1 in particular. Now, what was so significant about 96 and uh, why I'm doing this review on my car? Well, the, Z, the uh, 96 was very significant because you basically had two options. You could get the base level car with the LT1 that we've all come to love with the four-speed automatic, and it worked really good by that time. Um, there were some problems with the LT1 that I should briefly mention. And those of you that have owned the cars know what I'm talking about. The OptiSpark was just a disaster in so many ways. Um, the OptiSpark was basically the ignition system. And the problem with it was if you got any type of moisture on it, or even if oil leaked on it from the front main, it would turn it into a boat anchor. And it was very expensive to fix because... You had to remove everything on the front of the engine. You had to remove basically all the pulleys in the front. You had to remove the water pump. And this is why, you know, if you're ever going to replace an OptiSpark on a later model C4, LT1, LT4, you always replace the water pump if you're going to do the, uh, the OptiSpark because it just makes sense. You don't want to do the off to spark, put all the parts and everything back together. And then, I don't know, maybe like a year later, a month later, have to replace the uh, water pump. It's terrible. So you do both. Always do both. Anyway, so there is actually a fix for that. So there's a company, MSD. I'm sure you're all familiar with MSD. They, they're known for making performance um, ignition systems. And they basically um, redesign the off to spark where it's a sealed self-contained unit. So if a little bit of oil or moisture gets on it, it doesn't ruin it. And then I could tell you 
I've had uh, MSDs in my 96 since, um, I would say, when I rebuilt my engine the first time, the 355 that was in it. That was back in 2008. So I've only had to do two OptiSparks in that time that are MSD. And, you, you know, you got to remember, if you race your Corvette and you drive the shit out of it like I do, and you have super stiff springs like I have, it's just the optical trigger on the OptiSpark gets damaged because it just shakes. You, you know, especially if you go over a bump or something or kind of a dip in the road at really high speeds, it shakes it. And over time, it's going to damage it. It's just, it is what it is. That's the price of racing and having fun with your Corvette. <laughs> so anyway, that was the end of the ZR1. And in 96, they didn't just want to, GM just didn't want to end that era, you know, like they had had it the last four years, right? They just decided, okay, let's do something really interesting here. And they basically decided to add some mods to the LT1. And what did they do? Well, the first thing that they did was they put much bigger cylinder heads on it. Now, the cylinder heads have um, 170cc intake ports on it. The ones they put on it for the LT4 had 195cc intake ports. The other thing they did was they put a half-inch lift cam in it, which is really kind of a hot rodder's way of making more power, which was exciting. And then they put better um, rollers and rockers on it with sodium-filled valve stems, and they even changed the crank on it. They put a nodular crank in it, but it was still an iron crank. It wasn't anything to write home about. Anyway, what was the results? Well, according to GM, it made 330 horsepower at 6,300 RPMs and 340 foot-pounds of torque, just like the LT1. Now, I could tell you from experience, the LT4 made more than advertised. Um, it made more or less like 300, between 350 and 360 horsepower on average. And how do I know this? Well, in 2003, when my engine was completely stock and all I had on it was a Flowmaster exhaust system, which by the way, is a terrible exhaust system from that era because, well, a lot of reasons. The main reason is not a perfectly straight through exhaust system like the Borla. And also the the circumference of the tubing was smaller than factory and i didn't know this at the time so the factory exhaust tubing was two and three quarter inch the flowmaster exhaust system was two and a half inches which is the same uh, circumference as the lt1 so that was another um difference i failed to mention just briefly here is the uh the lt4 has two and three quarter inch um exhaust tubing and the lt1 has two and a half inch. And like I said, you know, I'm sure, um, you know, thinking about Flowmaster, they didn't want to create two different exhaust systems for really a car that was only released one year, which was 96. So that's what they did, two and a half inch. And I, I don't believe it made much more power than stock, the, the exhaust system. Anyway, how do I know that the horsepower performance on my LT4 was very similar to the early model LS1? Well, I did a dyno day with my Corvette club and a lot of people there, you know, had a lot of money and they had new uh, C5s with LS1s in them, 2002s, 2001s, 2003s, 2004s. And it was in 2003 actually, but there were some 2004 models that were there that day and none of them made more than 315 to the wheels 317 right around there mine made 313 to the wheels and i remember that day everyone's just being blown away like wow your car makes a lot of power what's up with that what, what, what engine do you have in there and i remember telling them about the lt4 now some of you corvette fans will be like oh come on they didn't know about the lt4 you know a lot of people didn't know about the lt4 in that era they just didn't because it was right before the redesign of the C5. It was right before the rollout of the LS1. It was under a lot of people's radars. And I think GM, you know, knowing they wanted to give um, people that bought the 96 Corvettes something nice, and that was a good gift from GM, the LT4. And that's why um, the 96 was such a pivotal year because it did mark the end of the C4 era, but it also uh, had the gift of the LT4 motor. So that was just a brief review of the C4. Let's get back to my car and my review. And if you enjoyed the content here today, 
please don't forget to like and subscribe to the video. When you like it, it puts us in the algorithm and people can see it. All right. Thanks again, everyone.